Thanks for uh, following the Sydney Institute's um, ongoing series of virtual meetings at a time of pandemic. Uh, and today, uh, today we have uh, Michael Knight, who is well known to people in Sydney and beyond Sydney because of his role in the Olympics. So Mr Knight was the MP for Campbelltown between 1981 and 2001. He then filled various positions in Bob Carr's long, uh, long serving uh, government in New South Wales. Um, he was in the cabinet between 1995 and 2001, uh, best known probably as the Minister for the Olympics, but also had ministerial responsibility at different times for public works, for roads, involved in budgets and whatever. And tonight, Mr Knight's going to talk for us on the topic of rock stars or dogged competitors, how to pick a leader of the opposition. Michael Knight, thank you very much. Leading the main opposition political party in any parliament in Australia is a temporary job, not a career. It either ends in becoming leader of a government or it ends in tears. Many lose the leadership after their party fails to win a general election. Some don't even last until a general election defeat. Almost every leader of the opposition has periods where their colleagues and the media speculate on whether he or she is the right person to lead their party to victory. Sometimes that talk crystallises into a formal challenge. Currently, Anthony Albanese, Labor's federal leader, is the subject of media speculation that he'll be replaced before the next election. Aspirants have been trailing their coats, though no formal challenge has emerged and still looks unlikely. In Victoria, the state Liberal leader Michael O'Brien is under siege. Those who cover the position have not been shy about briefing the media on what they see as O'Brien's failings. And in New South Wales, Labor leader Jody McKay appears to be in serious trouble. Whenever there's talk of replacing an opposition leader, the focus is usually on the perceived personal popularity of the contenders. I believe this is a very superficial approach which fundamentally misunderstands the nature of political leadership in the Australian electoral context. Generally, media pundits, and unfortunately some MPs, want to pick rock stars. But they often turn out to be shooting stars who burn brightly for a short while in the glow of media, public or party adulation, but they seldom win elections, and they definitely don't win consecutive elections. At the outset, we should acknowledge just how complex leadership of a major political party can be, especially in opposition. I'll use a rugby league analogy to illustrate this, but you could name pretty much any professional sport, female or male. Last year, the NRL Premiership was won by the Melbourne Storm. Their coach was Craig Bellamy, Cameron Smith was their captain, and Ryan Pappenhausen was their star player in the grand final. Three big jobs, three huge talents. But in a parliamentary party, especially in opposition, these three jobs have to be done by the one person. The leader has to be the star player, best at confronting the government in question time, best at pushing the opposition's agenda in the media and on the stump, and the best at relating to potential voters. The leadership also has to be the captain of the team, the person who manages the day-to-day -day tactics, decides what issues to run on each day, which team members should get their hands on the ball, speech, a question in Parliament, media appearance, visit to a region, etc. What percentage of the time to spend trying to disrupt the other team, the government, and what percentage to spend trying to advance the opposition's own policy agenda. The leader is also responsible for keeping up team morale when things are not going well. This role of team captain requires intelligence, toughness, vision and interpersonal skills. And it's made even harder because there are always some members of the team who only want to play their best if they or someone very close to them gets to be captain instead. To cap it all off, the leader has to take on the coaching responsibilities, to pick the team, that is, select the shadow cabinet, select the shadow parliamentary secretaries, hire the support staff. In New South Wales, the New South Wales parliamentary leader gets a lump sum to hire all of the staff, not only for his or her office, but to serve all of the shadow ministers as well. The leader also has to drop players who aren't performing and wear the odium for doing that. Above all, they must devise a game plan for how to win the next election. 
And like any good sporting coach, the opposition leader has to work closely with club management, the party office, to have a common vision for the party, its mission, policy agenda, and the role of its members, stakeholders, and supporters. They also have to work cooperatively to recruit the next generation of talent into the team, the parliamentary party. Not surprisingly, many opposition leaders struggle to fill this range of roles. Regrettably, some fail in all three. The way in which these roles mesh is crucial. The voting public and the media are used to seeing the opposition leader as their party's main salesperson. What they usually see much less of is the even more important role that the leader must take in developing the product. Significantly, it's those opposition leaders who master all of these three main roles, star player, captain and coach, who go on to have the most electorally successful careers. John Howard, federally, and Bob Carr in New South Wales are two classic examples. Yet neither of these leaders initially fitted the media archetype of what an ideal opposition leader should look like. They were not deemed to be charismatic or widely regarded as especially good looking. Above all, they were not popular to start with. But they both had characteristics which I believe are far more important for successful political leadership. High intelligence, a strategic mind, resilience and political judgment. Popularity as measured by opinion polls is a very risky basis for predicting whether a leader will win a future election. There are cases of opposition leaders who trailed badly in the polls, but who went on to win multiple elections. Again, John Howard and Bob Carr are two who polled poorly, but became long-term leaders of government. During his first period as opposition leader, the Bulletin magazine on the 20th of December 1988 carried a photo on its front page of John, ha John Howard with the savage headline, Mr. 18%, why on earth does this man bother? Inside, there was a Roy Morgan poll showing Howard's preferred Prime Minister rating at 18% compared to Bob Hawke's 69%. Howard never got to find out if he could win the 1990 federal election. He was ousted by Andrew Peacock in May 1989. March the next year, Labor narrowly won re-election with only 49 0.9% of the two-party preferred vote. The handsome, charismatic and television-friendly Andrew Peacock never fulfilled his long-talked-of destiny to become Prime Minister of Australia. Yet the nerdy John Howard, in very different circumstances, won the Prime Ministership from Paul Keating in March 1986. Howard held it until November 2007. He served the second longest time of any Australian Prime Minister only surpassed by Bob Menzies. There's an obvious symbiotic relationship between how well a government's perceived to be performing and the standing of the opposition leader. The higher the figure for the incumbent, as preferred Prime Minister or Premier, the lower the figure for any opposition leader must be. When Bob Hawke was at his zenith, Howard's rating as an alternative had to be low, whether he was any good or not. Similarly, in the lead up to the 1996 election, when Paul Keating's government was on the slide, Howard's preferred Prime Minister rating was much better than it was previously. Bob Carr had an uninterrupted route to the New South Wales Premiership, although it did take him seven years as opposition leader. And it was not without regular trauma. I served in the New South Wales Parliament when Carr was opposition leader, and his core business included suffering regular media commentaries about why he couldn't possibly win, while simultaneously fending off threatened leadership challenges, both real and imagined. Carl's pa Carr's poll numbers reflected this negative view of him. He was not burdened by high expectations. Prior to the 1991 election, the Sydney Morning Herald gave great prominence to an article by its state politics reporter, Matthew Moore, headlined, heading for a car crash. In fact, at that election, Labor dramatically improved its position from holding 43 seats out of 109 to winning 46 seats in a parliament which had been reduced to 99 seats. In the lead up to the 1995 election, the conventional wisdom was that the bookish, awkward car, that didn't even have a driver's license, let alone children, could not possibly beat the everyman image of the avuncular ex-footballer family man John Fay. Yet Carr not only won the 1995 election, 
He later became the longest continuously serving Premier in the history of New South Wales. A year before the 2011 New South Wales election, Barry O'Farrell trailed Christina Keneally as preferred Premier by 30% to 45% in a news poll survey. The estimated two-party preferred vote for the coalition he led was favourable, 55 to 45. But there were regular concerns that O'Farrell could be a drag on his party's vote at the election, that Labor could ride a wave of personal popularity for Christina Keneally to victory. However, at the subsequent election, O'Farrell led the coalition to increase its representation by a staggering 34 additional seats, while the Keneally-led Labor Party was reduced to a rump of 20. On the other side of the coin, there are opposition leaders who look good in the polls but fail to win government. In March uh, 2004, the then Labor leader Mark Latham had a news poll personal approval rating of 66%, still the second highest of all time for a federal opposition leader. But he did not win that election, only seven months later when he faced John Howard. Instead, Latham is now a One Nation representative in the New South Wales Upper House. The third highest news poll approval rating ever for a federal opposition leader belongs to the Liberal John Hewson at 55% in January 1992. He also lost the subsequent election just over a year later to Paul Keating. I don't believe in replacing an opposition leader simply because of bad polling, especially when their party is competitive in the two-party preferred projections. Both sitting MPs and media commentators sometimes get seduced by the notion that a more attractive leader will clinch victory for a party which is competitive in the polling but not a certain winner. This often ignores the role that the incumbent might have played in getting their party into that competitive position in the first place. However, I must admit that an opposition leader's case for survival is much weaker if they have had a reasonable period in the job and both their party's polling and their personal approval ratings are very poor. More importantly, if the bad polling is reflecting deeper fundamental reasons why they are not up to the job, then that is definitely a reason to make a change. So if you don't pick your opposition leaders based on opinion polls, then how do you know who'd be best? Part of the problem is you never know who is any good at the job until they get to do it. Like in any job interview, some aspirants present superbly, but turn out to be hopeless when you've given them the job. Conversely, there are some who don't do so well in the job seeking phase, but grow into the job surprisingly well. So what are the clues to look for? Popularity is one of the most overrated things in politics. Of course it's always better to be popular than to be loathed. But popularity is often spoken about as though it exists in a vacuum, as though it's some sort of individual character trait. In fact, a leader is likely to be popular because they're being successful in their job, rather than being successful in their job because they're popular. Significantly, both John Howard and Bob Carr morphed from being unpopular opposition leaders into popular heads of government when the voters liked how their governments were performing. If I've learned one thing in the decades I've spent involved with electoral politics, it's this. Electoral popularity never lasts. Unfortunately, it usually lasts longer for your opponents than you'd want, and it never lasts as long for you as you'd like, but it never endures for anyone. I recall a sort of collective political depression amongst New South Wales Labor MPs after Mike Baird's electoral victory in March 2015. They'd bought into the general media narrative that Baird was hugely popular and therefore unbeatable. However, following a range of self-inflicted political damage, forced council amalgamations, lockout laws in parts of Sydney, a failed attempt to ban greyhound racing, Baird's popularity collapsed. Between December 2015 and September the next year, his net satisfaction rating fell by a staggering 46%. Writing in The Australian, veteran political journalist Mark Coulton described it as the biggest fall in net satisfaction of any mainland state premier in the history of news poll. Quite sensibly, Baird retired mid-term. 
Long-standing liberal pollster Mark Texter has coined a wonderful phrase to encapsulate the transitory nature of popularity for many politicians. They might be superficially personally popular, but the underlying fundamentals of what they stand for and how they perform cannot sustain that. Alluding to an unusual body of water between Canberra and Goulburn, Texter refers to Lake George popularity. Like its namesake, such popularity is wide but very shallow and it completely evaporates with almost no warning. Popularity can be ephemeral. Intelligence is not. Howard and Carr might or might not have been the most intelligent members of their teams, but there's no doubting that both Howard and Carr are highly intelligent. A high level of intelligence is much undervalued as a quality for political leadership. Nobody votes for leaders because they consider them to be particularly intelligent, and it's not a characteristic that you should officially campaign on. But unless an opposition leader is very bright, not just street smart and cunning, they're unlikely to win an election. When a Prime Minister or a Premier is in the job, they can't be expected to know the intricate details of every portfolio all of the time. But they need to have a breadth of intelligence to understand how they all fit together. And they should have the intellectual agility to very quickly get across the detail of any issue in any portfolio when it emerges as a political or policy challenge. High intelligence is a basic requirement for the job. It is not an optional extra. No matter how badly a government's doing, it's extremely difficult to defeat them if the voters do not think that the leader of the opposition is capable of becoming the head of a functioning government. High intelligence is a significant part of that, though not the only factor. When they were opposition leaders, both Carr and Howard suffered numerous criticisms, some justified, some not. They were both frequently characterised as not being electable. But there was never any widespread perception that they were not up to the job of running a government if they somehow managed to get elected. In contrast, think of some of the recent leaders of the opposition who failed to win elections that were genuinely competitive, genuinely up for grabs. Deb Frecklington in Queensland last year, Peter Debnam in New South Wales in 2007, and Michael Daly in New South Wales in 2019. All of them pleasant and decent people. But the internal party research of the winning party each time revealed a perception that, rightly or wrongly, voters did not consider any of them to be up to the job of running a government. While popularity is probably the most overvalued quality in political leadership, the most underrated quality is political judgment. It's the great intangible of politics, but it's nonetheless profoundly important. You can't teach it, though over time John Howard seemed to have developed it himself. It is the quality which always accompanies long-term successful political leaders. Neville Rand was attractive, intelligent, well-spoken, the TV camera loved him. He also had fantastic political judgment. Rand instinctively knew where the voters were on a particular issue, which issues he could move them on, and which positions he had to accept whether he liked it or not. Bob Hall, Carr and Howard also had great intuitive political judgment. And the same could not be said of all of their successors. I think Anastasia Palaszczuk has it in spades, whereas Campbell Newman appeared to have a congenital deficit. Mike Baird's lack of political judgment led him badly astray on several issues, including his attempt to ban greyhound racing. I acknowledge that political judgment is a less objective characteristic than high intelligence, but it's nonetheless both real and immensely important. And the affliction of time usually shows whether a leader's political judgment was on target or not. Rather than try and define it, I'll give you two short examples. Following his victory in 1988, Nick Greiner introduced legislation to create the Independent Commission Against Corruption, the ICAC. Many in New South Wales Labor, me included, feared this would be a sort of standing royal commission into the Labor Party's recently completed 12 years of government. Bob Carr, however, insisted that Labor support the legislation. He stared down massive opposition in his own party. His political instincts were that unless he did this, Labor would be perceived by voters as pro-corruption and covering up for past misdeeds. 
that Labor would never have clear air that it needed to attack the Griner government on any of their performance failures. Not only did Carr's judgment prove to be accurate, but an ICAC inquiry later led to Griner himself being forced to relinquish the Premiership. In July 2016, Mike Baird announced his intention to completely ban greyhound racing. He relied upon a report from former High Court judge Michael McHugh, a Labor favourite, outlining some pretty horrific animal cruelty. There was initially strong support for Baird's proposal from the media and also from many in the State Parliamentary Labor Party. Opposition leader Luke Foley, however, instinctively felt that whatever the problems in the greyhound industry, Baird's proposals were an overreaction that could rebound on him politically. Foley felt that no one would shift their vote to Baird because of this single policy. However, a substantial number of voters, particularly in rural electorates, could shift their votes away from the government on this policy alone. Foley came out quickly against the proposed ban. That was not a position initially popular with his colleagues, and some of them tried to use it to undermine his leadership at the time. Like Carr with the ICAC, time vindicated Foley's judgment. Baird's greyhound ban was a significant contributor to the Nationals losing the by-election in Orange on the 12th of November 2016. This led directly to the forced resignation two days later of Deputy Premier Troy Grant, and to Baird's own voluntary retirement two months later. Whatever you might think of the merits of the issue, Foley's political judgment on it was absolutely spot on. Good political judgment is particularly an issue for opposition leaders. They frequently need to respond at very short notice to government announcements, mistakes and initiatives. Often there's little time to consult. Unlike in government, there's no time or money to research public attitudes. In the example above, Foley had to personally make a very quick decision these decisions are driven by judgment, good or bad, not by focus groups. The climate in which opposition leaders need to exercise their political judgment is becoming more difficult. Both the explosion of social media and the intensification of hyper-partisanship amongst the keyboard warriors raise additional challenges. Perhaps the greatest challenge is to decide when to attack the government and when not to. It's very easy for an opposition leader to attack the government on everything. That will bring immediate approval from those who follow the leader on their social media platforms. Indeed, if the opposition leader is not whacking the government at every opportunity, they're likely to be criticised as too quiet, weak, compliant, lazy or just plain useless. They will get that from mainstream media commentators, on social media and from some of their own colleagues. However, being seen to be overtly partisan on certain issues can be counterproductive with the electorate generally and with swinging voters in particular. How various leaders of the opposition have handled the politics of the COVID-19 pandemic reveals some very different political judgments. Michael O'Brien, the Victorian Liberal leader, and Jody McKay, New South Wales Labor leader, have been constant critics of the handling of the pandemic by the governments in their states. Harsh words have been used and resignations have been called for. O'Brien is especially focused on the second wave in Victoria, which emanated from weaknesses in the state government's quarantine system. But attacking the Victorian government has been his default position. Interestingly, it has not inoculated O'Brien from those members of his party who seek to replace him. Some of his colleagues have criticised O'Brien for being too soft on Daniel Andrews and his government. McKay has been a strident critic of Gladys Berejiklian and her Health Minister Brad Hazard. The Ruby Princess debacle and the tra tragic deaths at Anglicare's New March House aged care facility were particular targets. But no failure has escaped her attention, including the inevitable problem of waiting times the first day a new pop-up clinic is set up in response to an unexpected outbreak. By contrast, when there was a COVID outbreak in South Australia in November last year, Peter Malinowskis, Labor's opposition leader, was quick to pledge bipartisan support to fight the virus. He specifically made it clear he would not be adopting the approach taken by Michael O'Brien. In part, Malinowskis' media release said, doing this the South Australian way means we're going to look after each other as much as we look after ourselves. We're going to fight for each other not against each other, which means as far as I'm concerned, 
unlike in Victoria, as opposition leader, I'm here to support the government, not undermine it. Since then, Malinowskis has been overwhelmingly non-partisan on this issue, but not silent. From time to time, he's raised suggestions that he hoped the government would embrace, and when they've not done so, he's expressed disappointment rather than outrage. When they've embraced his ideas, Malinowskis has praised the government and not indulged in some petty claim that he's won. Similarly, in the federal sphere, opposition leader Anthony Albanese and his then shadow health minister Chris Bowen walked a very careful path focused on confronting the pandemic rather than the government. Their approach could best be characterised as yes but. For example, they acknowledged the government's good work in signing deals with several possible vaccine producers, but suggested they should get some extra players involved to spread the risk. Similarly, they supported the government's initiatives in JobKeeper and JobSeeker, while also pointing out gaps in those programs and the risk of ending them prematurely. Compared to O'Brien and Mackay, there has been much more emphasis on cooperation and less on conflict. On those occasions when Albanese and Bowen, uh, and now Mark Butler, diverged substantially from the government, they picked their targets carefully and positioned themselves unambiguously on the side of the community, for example on the timing of vaccine rollouts, rather than simply being again the government. Which of the political judgments is the correct one? The O'Brien McKay model or the very different Malinowskis Albanese approach? As with all political judgments, time will tell which were sound. So, when it comes to picking the right leader of the opposition, these are the qualities I'd place a premium on. High intelligence, resilience. It's a tough job and you're bound to have more bad days than good days. And political judgment. I would always favour someone who can straddle the multiple roles of star player, captain and coach over someone who the commentariat merely declares is popular. Above all, I want someone who thinks strategically about how to win the next election, how to progress that plan and how to implement a defined agenda in government. If they look and sound nice, that's a very significant bonus. But I would be looking for someone who understands how tough it is to win from opposition. I'm always wary of the leadership aspirant who believes that the voters will choose them over the incumbent, Prime Minister, Chief Minister or Premier simply because they are a better person or more attractive or more deserving. Those whose underlying electoral strategy is see me, love me, vote for my candidates. I always prefer a potential leader of the opposition who can tell me how they're going to win rather than why they should win. And by and large, those are the same leaders who go on to win. Those are the ones that the electorate ends up respecting the most and those are the same people who not only win once, but go on to lead long-term governments. Well, many thanks to Michael Knight and thanks to our members who have sent in some questions. So we're now going to have a 30-minute discussion and then we'll wind up. Thank you. Well, thanks for a very thoughtful but uh, very clearly expressed uh, paper on um, opposition leaders, focusing as you did on uh, Bob Carr and John Howe. But let me read you the names, and you know them well, of the people who have won government from opposition at the federal level and tell me what they had in common or what any one of them didn't fit in. So Robert Menzies, 1949, uh, Gough Whitlock, 1972, Malcolm Fraser, 1975, Bob Hawke, 1983, John Howard, 1996, Kevin Rudd, 2007, and Tony Abbott, 2013. Now they're the seven yeah. opposition leaders who've got into government from opposition since the end of the Second World War. How do they fit into your view? Okay, uh, most of them, and I've spoken about Howard, most of them were people I would describe as dogged competitors. Um, Menzies, uh, certainly. Um, and some of them also were rock stars, but they weren't rock stars in isolation. Uh, Whitlam's a classic example. You know, Whitlam appeared publicly uh, to be charismatic, interesting, good-looking compared to previous generations of politicians. 
But Gough was a relentless competitor. He reformed the Labour Party. He reformed the caucus. He struggled. Uh, he took risks. He put his leadership on the line against uh, the, the 36 faceless men. He, he did all of those things. And, and he had his hands all over policy and new directions. Gough uh, was not a show pony. Gough was somebody who was to some people, very attractive, and not so attractive to the electorate uh, in 1975, but he, he did all that underlying work. Uh, Menzies was a bit the same, uh, although I, I never really knew him, it's only what I know of him. Uh, Howard definitely uh, was the dogged competitor from Central Casting and kept at it and kept thinking about it, and you would know that from the time you spent with him. Uh, he, he never had this sort of sense of self-entitlement that I just front up and people will vote for me. And uh, Fraser was, was dogged and difficult. Um, he made life incredibly hard for Goff when Goff was leader. He, he worked at it. Um, so most of those guys worked at it. Uh, Rudd's a very interesting example because Kevin was the ultimate dogged competitor. You know, Kevin was intelligent, hardworking, relentlessly trying to work out how to get there. Uh, and as part of that, Kevin sort of reinvented himself for a period as a rock star. Um, I think everyone's over that now except perhaps Kevin, but <laughs> he, he, was, he was very dogged. But of that group, um, probably two stand out as being popular. Bork for quite a while, and Kevin Rudd briefly. Yeah. So popularity is not the central thing. I don't think, yeah. as I recall, Whitlam was well known yeah. and there was his rock star, but he yeah. wasn't that popular yeah. when he won in '72. But Bork clearly was, and Rudd clearly was. But with Rudd, it didn't last, and with Hawke, it did last. Hawke, well, it did last. But the, at first glance, Hawke looks like the exception that proves the rule because. He was very popular as soon as he became leader. He hadn't been in Parliament very long. But Bob had been in politics for generations. Bob had a highly political job as president of the ACTU. Uh, for a long time, he was also very publicly president of the Labor Party. I remember the great line of Hawks when he was asked, how could you hold two jobs like that at once? And, well, very classic Bob said, if you can't ride two horses at once, you shouldn't be in the bloody circus to begin with. Um, but Bob, Bob was very well known and, and he had a track record of both fighting disputes and settling disputes. And he carried that style across to, uh, to his prime ministership. Now, people who look at Bob from the outside think, oh yeah, well, he loved a drink and he'd go out when he was not the leader and he'd have too much to drink and he'd be a bit too indiscreet. And all those things were true, but they didn't see how hard he worked underneath. Um, Bob, Bob was, was like that old generation of footballers that would get on the grog the night before and then go and train twice as hard as anyone the next day. Pretty hard to do these days, but, but that was Bob. And so his popularity held up. All of the popularity that holds up in government is based on performance. Um, you know, if, if you are the most lovable, wonderful, exciting person and you turn up as a Premier or Prime Minister and you don't deliver, pretty soon that falls off a cliff. So you're saying that's what happened with Kevin Rudd and I think from your paper with Mike Baird. Hmm. Yeah, Mike, Mike overreached. Um, Mike, Mike's political judgment was not good. Not lovely fella, um, but his, his political judgment, I think, was quite flawed. And Kevin Rudd? Kevin, um, Kevin, Kevin's political judgment in government was nowhere near as good as what people thought it was going to be when he was in opposition. You know, Kevin had uh, some reasonably good political judgment in opposition, but, and one of the things about leaders, Jared, is while they are right at the pointy end of everything that happens, it doesn't mean they exist in a vacuum without advice from others. Uh, 
the key to the leader is not deciding, not, not making everything up, not having every idea themselves, but sifting which of the advices to go with. And I think there was a bit of a tendency widely perceived when Kevin was in government that while he might have been sifting ideas in opposition, he wasn't listening in government. He, he was the repository of all good ideas. So if you look around today, and you've been through most of the states in your talk, um, are many of these opposition leaders failing because they don't meet your standards of intelligence, uh, resilience and judgment, or are they failing because it's a pandemic and it's a pretty hard job? Well, it's certainly a harder job in the pandemic, uh, but it's not an impossible job in the pandemic. And while all the governments that have gone to election during the pandemic have been re-elected, several of them have lost a number of seats. Uh, the Labor Green Coalition got re-elected in the ACT, but Labor lost seats. Um, Labor got re-elected in the Northern Territory, but it lost seats to a quite impressive new leader of the opposition there. So it's not a lay down the Zaire. Uh, I think uh, Malinowskis is certainly in the game at the next South Australian election. I don't think those things are a lost cause. Certainly the pandemic makes it harder, but the question is how do you handle the pandemic? So that goes back to judgment? Hmm. I think so. But it's, if you take Michael O'Brien's position in Victoria, you've got a very strong Premier and Daniel Andrews, but on the other hand, he's overseeing the worst outcome in health terms throughout the whole of Australia, and yet Michael O'Brien can't prevail against that. So um, what does he do? I mean, what's lacking with his judgment or resilience? Or He's a bright guy. Well, so what's well I haven't seen any internal party polling, but I would be surprised if the internal Labor polling didn't suggest that O'Brien, in the minds of the electors right now, is not up to the job of being Premier. Um, I think that's, that's an issue. Uh, I think there's also the problem that the way in which the Victorian Liberal Party's criticised Daniel Andrews has looked more like they're critical of Victoria and Victoria's response and that they're almost unpatriotic rather than that they're criticising the Labor bloke for a mistake. I think they've, they've got the nuance wrong. So what do you Not do? Not my job to help them get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you do? Well, you, can't, you can't actually say that it's the Andrews government is a star performer in handling uh, COVID-19 compared with the other eight governments in the country. So what, does, what do you do? You say nothing. Um, well, sometimes you're better off saying nothing, but, but again, look at what Albanese's done. He's been gently supportive, raised issues, tried to lead debate from time to time, rather than the sort of traditional political cheap point scoring. I think the other thing that is relevant to all of these opposition leaders going forward now is how how do they respond to what we hope is the end of the pandemic? How do they respond going forward? It's, it's easy to get re-elected in the middle of a war, but as Winston Churchill found out, it ain't no guarantee after the war if people think you aren't going to make the country fit for heroes. Now, I don't know whether across the Nullarbor, whether Zach Kirkup uh, knew you were coming here today, but uh, you certainly provide an interesting case study of a, of a leader who threw in the towel before the first round commenced. So how does that work as a tactic? Oh, I don't think he had a lot of choice. Um, I, I think probably, the, funnily enough, the best thing he could do is say, look, we're not going to win this, we're not going to pretend we're going to win this, um, get, give us a crack at trying to keep the government honest, and don't turn it into a one-party state. I think he didn't have much choice. Not sure he picked the right issues on which to do that. But then my job's not to advise Liberal Party opposition leaders to do better. Well, they may appreciate that. Some of them can do with a bit of advice. 
and, and the other, on the other side as as well. So you, but no one ever has really done that before. I mean, people have hinted that their that their chances of winning are not good, but no one's actually ever said, as I recall, that you know we're going to lose. Help us out. Uh, no, but but sometimes uh, it, it doesn't help you if if the public have doubts and they think you're going to win. And I mean, I think there was a grave error in the last New South Wales election where the General Secretary at the time was parading the fact that she had polling and Labor was going to win and they were going to smash the government. And I certainly said to the electorate, in my view, well, it ain't safe to protest vote against the government because you might elect these people and have a close look at the Labor team and only vote for them if you think they're ready. So I think uh, talking up your chances can be counterproductive. So in that election, for those who are not so familiar with New South Wales politics, uh, Gladys Berejiklian and prevailed over Michael Daly, but mm -hmm. Gladys Berejiklian always looked like a very solid leader, didn't she? Oh, Gladys has her strengths and her weaknesses. Um, and not my place to analyse either of them publicly today, but Gladys ha had her strengths. Um, she lost some seats. Um, she was vulnerable. She was vulnerable. Um, can't do anything about the past. I, if, if Luke Foley had have still been leading the party, and I completely understand why he wasn't, I think we were, we would have given her a much better run for her money. So when you talk today, you've really highlighted, as you know, uh uh, Bob Carr and hmm. John Howard. So let's look at Bob Carr initially, because uh, you were close to him. I recall with a business figure when Bob Carr was in opposition and we drove past him as he was in the street, and this guy said to me, oh, he's hopeless, he said, Bob, Bob will never win, which was not a view that I held, but I could see that how Bob Carr was working in the suburbs and the regional areas and that lead up to those elections and how hard he was working. Hmm. I could recognise that, but he was he was dismissed as being um, really as being unelectable by mm. many people. They thought he just didn't have the appearance, mm. but he did. But he got there gradually, narrowly, and then he increased his mm. margin having got there. So, what was it like working with Bob Carr in opposition? Well, well, I, I don't pretend I was close to Bob in opposition. I, I was. Uh the, the naughty boy from central casting for a lot of my time in opposition. Even then? Uh, even then, Jared, even then. In fact, um, Bob, Bob once moved a censure motion on me in caucus, um, and I think I was the only vote against it. Um, and so what was that about? Oh, I'd done a radio interview um, where the interviewer was, was saying, look, you must be getting frustrated, you're not breaking through, you doing those things, you're getting knocked over. And, and I very cheekily said, oh no, look, that I was on the left in those days. It's the nature of life in the left. You throw up ideas, uh, they get knocked over, but eventually they get accepted. Uh, I recall going down and voting at the annual conference regularly for policies to save the rainforests and people like Bob Carr had come and stick their hand up against it. And now Bob's an arch apostle of saving the rainforest. So you've got to take a longer term view of this. Um, Bob took a much shorter term view of it, got pretty cranky, uh, and, and ended up moving a, a censure motion in caucus. Um, I think it was one of the few occasions his political judgment got led astray by his personal distress. But in the event, you, you get into the cabinet because hmm. you're elected by your colleagues, hmm. right? Not yeah. because you're chosen yeah. by Bob Carr. So his attitude changed, did it? Oh, um, well, I think Bob would say that when my behaviour changed, his attitude changed, and I worked very close with, with him in about the last six months before we won the election, and then closely for the early part of the government. Um, but the thing, the thing I say about Bob is consistent with what I've, I've written in this paper, um, and that is that Bob was thinking about how to win, was working on how to win, was highly intelligent, had good political judgment, good political instincts, and had a plan. And from time to time, people in the caucus, not just in the media, would say, oh, we're gonna get rid of this bloke, you know, he, 
he, he's not good looking enough or he's not uh, charismatic enough or you know we can't win and we should go with this bloke or this woman or that bloke and I always voted for Bob um, even if we were bluey because I took the view that we had two choices at the 95 election and that was Bob Carr in good shape and Bob Carr in not so good shape and I was for Bob Carr in good shape and did whatever I could in the last year or so, particularly in the last six months, to help in whatever small way I could. But I think he was the only person who could actually win it. The, the pretenders were, oh, look, I'll be more popular or I'll look better on television or people will like me more. None of the substance that you needed. Let's go talk about um, John Howard for a minute. I left, I worked for John 94, 84, 85, 86. I left at the end of 86. And as you know, and you mentioned in your paper, he didn't win the 87 election. By the time you get to 1990, Andrew Peacock's there, and he's a good looking and attractive personality. But I always felt that in that election, Howard had the more substance yeah. and um, Hawke won narrowly. Now, I always thought maybe in 87, Peacock might have just got over the line, but by the time you get to the economic problems of the early 90s, it looked like a person of substance, which hmm. it, it later came true with Howard. But So what you're suggesting is that substance and judgment matters more than presentation. Yeah, look, it, it, it helps if you've got both, like Neville Rand and Bob Hawke. Um, it, it's obviously a bonus, but substance, political judgment, intelligence, a plan, an idea, the ability to transcend those different roles of star player, captain and coach. You know, one of the things that disturbs me about the way people look at leadership of the opposition around the country is, well, who will be the most popular? You know, who, who can we pick who will be the most popular? It's about a lot more than who will do a good TV interview. It's about a lot more than who will be the best salesperson for the product. It's about the product. It's about developing the product. And Howard understood those things. Um, I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm the John Howard love him. Um, John, John and I were never friends and he, for some reason, didn't like me very much at all. I remember Max Moore Wilton, who worked for me as head of roads when he was head of prime minister. I was saying, Max, haven't you told him I'm a good bloke? And Max said, I've tried, Michael, but I've stopped. It's not doing either of us any good. <laughs> so, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't put me in the, in the close to John Howard camp, <laughs> but I respect... And of course, as you know, he was one of the rare characters who had three years as opposition leader and went out and then came back as opposition leader for a year yeah. or so. so that was most unusual. Most don't, yes. most only get one yeah. one girl, right. don't they? So you mentioned Neville Rand, who um, mm. you were a bit yeah. young when Neville was there. But just to remind us, because I wasn't living in New South Wales at the time, he Labor had a real problem with an opposition leader. I mean, Neville Rand came down from the upper house, yes. didn't he? Yes. So, so just give us a bit of background there. Okay, um, we were struggling. And can I make this point, Jerry? It is unusual for Labor to win elections from opposition in New South Wales. It's happened twice in the last 45 years. Okay, give us the dates. Uh, Neville won in 1976 yes. Yes. by one seat. Yes. Bob won in 1995, Bob Carr, by one seat. Those are the only times we've won from opposition in New South Wales. Um, now, part of the reason we haven't won so many times from opposition is those, those blokes won a few in a row from government, which yes. took up some of that time, which is yes. a good thing from Labor point of view. But it's, it's hard. It's not easy. It's, it's a rare thing. And we've been struggling a lot in opposition. And there was a push by the party secretary at the time. There was a, an agreement with Jack Ferguson, who was the leader of the left at the time, that they really needed a different approach, uh, a fresher approach, a, a better plan, a less traditional uh, plan for winning the election. 
and Neville got brought down from the upper house to lead us in the lower house. One in 76, and then won several elections after that, uh, and increased majorities. I came in in 81, so I was there for a while. Um, going back to John Hart for a minute, I remember, now this was a, in a media sense, it was a, quite a different generation, but one of our members has sent in this question. John Howard focused when he was in opposition, having been treasurer, in those days very much on radio because mm. there was no continuous news on the ABC, there was no Sky News, so there was nothing much you could do. You didn't get on a main bulletin, you didn't get it on at all, but there was a lot of time to be burnt up on radio if you're willing to do it. Now, what's the equivalent of that today? I mean, radio is still there, obviously, it's important, but what should... I mean, can you do too much uh, media as an opposition leader or in, in the new circumstances? Uh, I think the media is becoming more multi-headed. Um, I can remember, even the mainstream media, back in, in Carr's day, you'd break a story in the morning papers and then it'd be picked up by all the television sta stu stations later that day. And now, unless it's a really big story, they don't want to touch it, they want their own, they want their own exclusive. You often get different stories on the different networks. So I think it's a lot more hard work. There's a lot of different aspects just there. Uh, again, uh, radio is still important. Uh, social media is important. But the thing about social media, in my view, is how do you use social media to communicate to a target audience rather than to reinforce in an echo chamber? Telling your own supporters that Scott Morrison's a terrible Prime Minister will get you lots of likes, um, but it's not going to shift a single swing voter. So you've got to be a lot smarter in the way you target and the way you leverage those things. Now, because we're sort of going national when we put this up on YouTube, there's the case of Campbell Newman, obviously up in, mm. in Queensland, who, who won a terrific victory and then narrowly lost. Now, he lost his own seat because mm. it was a pretty marginal seat, yeah. but he, and he lost the government narrowly, but he did go in. He had a probably a, a majority, which will be a bit like the Labor government in Western Australia yeah. after the next election, yeah. I mean a huge majority. Now I don't know whether you've focused on that much, but as an opposition leader coming out of the Brisbane City Council, he looked really good, and then within three years or so it was all, it all crumbled, and now he's a commentator on Sky News, and he's got advice for others, but how do you look at Campbell? Uh, I haven't looked closely at Campbell, but I mean, he was doing fine in, in Brisbane Council. It was a very unusual thing where they made him the leader of the opposition, even though he wasn't in the parliament. Yeah. So there's so something about the capacity of those that were, were there that you had know, to pick a bloke who wasn't even in the parliament to be the leader. Uh, he faced a Labor government that was in a lot of trouble uh, and uh, rode the crest of a wave and then he adopted from a distance a very different approach to governing Queensland to the approach he'd adopted when he was Lord Mayor of Brisbane. Uh, much more confrontationalist, much more economic rationalist, a lot of casualties very quickly and I think, I don't know the guy and I might be doing him a disservice, I, I think he got carried away with the size of his majority and thought well that's alright we'll lose a few seats but it'll be worth it to follow through these agendas. I, I don't think he understood the depth of the problem he was creating electorally. Now we don't have long to go, so I thought I'd ask you about some issues you probably don't want to discuss. Mm. Bill Short, uh, two, two elections, didn't make it. Yeah. Narrow, narrowly, but didn't make it. Yeah. Well, well, it, it, what went wrong? What went wrong? Um, the first election we did well, we got close, we improved, we did better than people were expecting. The that's the one against Malcolm Turnbull, that's 2016. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. The, the second election, um, I think there was a bit of hubris, um, which I shared. Um, all of us in the Labour Party, looking at the polling, 
get carried away, you think we're going to get there. Um, so I don't, I don't think we anticipated how difficult a contest that was going to be. Um, and too many of us were thinking about how the government will get run, not how we'll get there. And, and I think that was a, a bit of a problem. And Morrison, Morrison had to get about eight things right out of nine, and, and he got eight things right out of nine. Long odds, but he did very well. And to contemporary times, Anthony Albanese, it's a difficult task. It's a difficult task. Um, I think the interesting thing about Anthony, if you go by the polling, is how competitive we are in the two party preferred. Some have a slightly in front, news poll has its 50 50. Um, so we're certainly competitive. You know, I wouldn't get excited about a figure moves one or two percent, you know, between polls. Uh, the, the trends means we're in the game. Um, now, Anthony has had less airtime in the last year because of COVID than an opposition leader would normally have. What we will see in the coming six, seven months is how productively he's used that time. If he's used that time to think about how to win, to prepare to win, to prepare for government, then he'll be quite a formidable opponent. And we'll, we'll know that if and when that unfolds. Um, I think he's the best option we've got at the moment. Right, Anthony Albanese gets hit by a bus. What's next in line? Without any particular order, Jim Chalmers, uh, Chris Bowen, Tanya Plebisic, I mean, who, who match it on intelligence, um, resilience and judgment? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question. Um, that's a question for others to make the judgment. I've set out some parameters and what I think are the tests. Uh, what I will say is that if, if there's a ballot, the current conditions in the Federal Caucus, the, the RUD rules, if you like, is that the caucus makes its decision and then there's a ballot of all the party membership across the country. I get one vote in that, just like everyone else. And the two of them are put together. Um, when Bill won, there was a different person won the party vote than won on the caucus vote. So explain that. Uh, Anthony Albanese won the party vote. Yep. Bill Shorten won the, ca the caucus vote. Party caucus and vote. he won the caucus vote by a bigger percentage than he'd lost the party membership vote. So these are hard to predict. Um, they're not sort of straightforward ballots like the old days in the caucus. And one of the great ironies is the, the people who changed the rules to protect themselves, Kevin and and then John Robertson in New South Wales, um, the rules became irrelevant. Kevin got turfed by the electorate and Robbo got tapped on the shoulder. Um, you know, I think some fairly unfair circumstances, but anyway, um, that's one of the ironies of politics. Well, look, um, I think it's a proper time to finish on the ironies of politics, because you've been very clear about your views about oppositions and leadership, and. Um, Let's go out on an irony, but it's an important one. So many thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry.